This is a lockdown booty call. A lockdown booty call. Hello! You are listening to episode 5 of Lockdown Booty Calls. My name is Robin Mood, and I'm pleased to report that the lockdown restrictions are having no effect on my mental state whatsoever. In today's episode, I speak with Max Ellis. Now, how do you describe Max? He is definitely, without a doubt, the most Max Ellis-y person I've ever met in my life. We chatted about how he went from being the frontman of a glam punk band in the 1980s to working as an illustrator and being commissioned to create pieces for some huge household names, often while drunk. We also discussed his photography and taking pictures of bodybuilders, drag queens, and squirrels. We chatted about how good music is. And it is pretty good, isn't it? If you've never heard of music, go and check it out. There's a good chance you may just like it. We had a few technical issues to sort out. We kept being hijacked by different family members. And we had to have a break midway so that Max could have some caviar. Turns out punk has changed quite a lot in the last 30 years. We didn't even have chance to talk about how he once punched David Baddiel or nearly died in a crash between Jonathan Ross's helicopter and a fighter jet over a nudist speech. There is some quite fruity language right from the start, so it's maybe not an episode for your nan, unless she's punk. But I hope you really enjoy the podcast because I had a lot of fun making it. So what are you waiting for? Go and get in there. Lockdown Booty Calls, episode five. I need a holiday. Max, welcome to Lockdown Booty Calls. Thank you so, so much for agreeing to be a guest. And I've been looking forward to this since you did agree, because I knew you'd bring some sort of flamboyance to the uh, podcast, which it hasn't been lacking, but I think you've definitely upped the ante. So how are you doing, Max? Welcome. I'm here. I'm friendly and colourful. I think colourful is the word. For those of you who are listening on the podcast version and not (laughs) watching the webcast, would you describe that as sky blue or lilac or what what well, is was, the color of your goatee and mohawk at the it moment it was actually on the bottle said turquoise and how long ago was that used actually not that i mean probably week week and a half that kind of say it's not okay. lasting that i mean blues don't stay in very well they're not very good pink is a much more as much longer longevity it's and a, is that the next color no no i've done pink. i've had pink too recently i quite like the blue i've got they started to do a a sort of navy capri blue in uh, stuff you buy from supermarkets so you can actually which is a permanent one but it's a lot darker so you know oh, just well, try we'll it keep, just keep us posted i yeah we're straight in with the uh, the lockdown hairdressing tips from well it is from what, the fashion guru. <laughs> what you do notice is like other people who aren't used to doing their own hair are fucked basically they just look like crap you know, and, and, and people that are terrified of hairdressers like me and they haven't been for 20 years are just like, it's normal. There's no change. So I can maintain my coiffure without any risk of looking like a twat. Whereas you see people who have like spent years going to the hairdressers and barbers, having themselves tarted and tweaked, look like rubbish now. So that's really good. Yeah, I keep seeing, obviously, um, lockdown haircuts all over the place, whether on social media or even in the street, and you think, wow, yeah, that, uh, yeah, the, the hairdresser is going to have a lot of business as soon as they're allowed to open again. Or I, 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 I had a trim in 2018, and so I'm glad I got it in <laughs> soon enough. Well, it's, it's either like, well, this because I had you know your longer hair previous to this, but this is the only two haircuts I can have. So I can have it long, where I don't have to go to the hairdressers and don't have anything to do to it. Or like this, where I can just do it myself in the mirror, with the occasional assistance of my son in the bedroom, who helps me with the uh, the dyeing and the uh, shaving the back if it gets out of control. What happens when the son gets out of control? That's what I want to know. He is out of control. I blame his influencers, to be honest. <laughs> He's just saying, <laughs> fuck you from the bedroom. Yeah, okay, that's, so... That's, fam- hair- that's family for you. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, that's uh, that's where we're at. So, first of all, can you just tell me sort of where you are spending this lockdown? Just describe your 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 home, your bunker, your creative shed, whatever you want to call it. Well, at this we're we're, we're really really lucky, and we know that we're lucky, and everyone's going to hate us. But we've got actually got three gardens, so we've got like a nice back garden, 
a nice front garden with a fern garden in it. And we've got this, this roof terrace, which we weren't really using. Previous to this, we kind of, we had it, it was just like a kind of horrible dumping ground for crap. But now it's it's become, you know, it's, it's actually a really nice space. We've got the wisteria growing up on the, it's like a little cave of wisteria. And uh, it's, it's is, lovely. Yeah. It's really, really nice. And it's it's sickening for anybody who's living in a flat or, you know, in a horrible sort of place with a you know, car park instead of a garden. You were wrong to make that front garden to a car park, weren't you? That was a mistake. So, you know, yeah. yeah. No, so we're at home. We've got um, my two sons, Zebedee and Gulliver and Catherine. Um, and we're kind of, yeah, we're quite comfortable, really. Affluently comfortable. Um, and I know you're not too far from Bushy Park as well, where you get a lot of your inspiration. And have you been yeah. able to venture out in the early morning mists as you as you often yeah. do? I mean, I have, but the the downside is I really don't like people. I don't like seeing people. I don't like being near people. And what's happened is that because of everyone now being off work and having loads of time and needing to go to the park and exercise – Fuckers are there from like half four in the morning. It's like people. It's like the other morning I was there at half four. Yesterday morning, there's a woman at, holding the gate for me to go into the park. I said, Gee, like, just A, back off. B, why are you in my park? You know, it's the summer. This is the summer months where I'm assured of peace and tranquility and I total isolation from mankind. And because of this, you know, ridiculous situation we're in, I'm stuck with other people, having to see people, talk to them occasionally, which I loathe. So, so, so your your biggest gripe with lockdown is it's forcing you to be more sociable than before. Yeah, is that it? There's, there's people, <laughs> yeah, in the places I don't want them to be, and I can't avoid them. <laughs> oh, social distancing! You've been practicing for it. I do. Long, long yeah, I have. I mean, it's literally my sort of you know default setting is get as far away from people as possible. Like when I go into the park. If I ever see, this is before lockdown, if I saw another person, I'd go in the opposite direction and find another route around them so I wouldn't have to talk to people or see them. So now it's, it's yeah, it's worse. I think uh, already, I think listeners are getting an idea of your character and personality. You've had a, a real selection of different careers and you've reinvented yourself on numerous occasions. Uh, I'd just like to chat a little bit about that, about how you got to where you are today, and let's start at the beginning. I left school at 17 and became a en precision engineer, and then I was going out with the daughter, the registrar of the art college, and got made redundant from being an engineer, and she said, well, why don't you go to art college? She went, okay, so I went to art college and um, got a grant, at least to pay to go to college back in the day, so I um, did that for basically a degree in illustration and photography for like five years I was there for because I got, didn't make it into the degree course, then reapplied, spent a year on a platform drawing people getting on and off trains and then, yeah, did, uh, did the degree. And during this said degree, I do what everyone at art college does, forms a crap band. So, yeah, I was in a crap band for many years. Well, that, that's a rite of passage, isn't it? Being in a crap band. I know I've yeah. been. I may have may have hogged You're still in crap bands. I've been been in quite a few. I'm I'm, I'm a solo performer. I don't know what that says yeah. about me, but uh, uh, quite a lot. I'm a crap one man band. I think. Yes. When you formed the band, uh, is mm. this is is this now God and the Crazy Lesbians that we're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So tell me where that took you then. Well, I mean, it was obviously it was all a bit of a. I mean, because we were in Brighton. And that's what you do in Brighton. You get drunk and form a band. So we got drunk and formed a band. And our first couple of gigs, we had we had some, you know, major sort of players in the band. So the first incarnation of God the Crazy Lesbians in Hell was basically me and my mate Jeremy, who's the uh, songwriter and bass player at the Levelers, formed this kind of industrial kind of band of banging oil drums and smashing up shopping trolleys on stage at the Zap Club in Brighton. And uh, we had uh, my girlfriend and another girl in the band as well, smashing things up, just basically. And Jeremy did the lyrics. He wouldn't tell anybody what the lyrics or what the words were to any of our songs. He just shouted over the top of us, smashing up oil drums. Somebody in the audience was hospitalised, and a, a large chunk of shopping trolley flew out and hit her in the head and, and carved a J-shaped chunk out of her head. 
Um, and then, but the, the prob- first mistake they made was by, before I actually got on stage, passed out through drinking too much. So they picked me up and just dropped me onto this stage and gave me a sledgehammer, at which point we just started fucking smashing the thing up. And then I remember escaping from the venue as the police arrived and ambulances and that kind of stuff and, and running down the beach. And then um, I don't know why we decided to do it properly, because obviously this was brilliant. You know, it could it, could it get, get much better, but we then I became the singer, because I couldn't, I couldn't keep smashing up shop, shopping drawers with it running out and oil drums hard to come by but I smashed my finger up on the edge of an oil drum a metal bar and a finger between the oil drum is a bad thing I've discovered that's a bad thing to do so I'm, we trying, did, to, I'm, we... I'm trying to pick out some of the lessons I should be taking should be learning from this so that that's the first one oil drums and trolleys stay clear of them don't do any of that so you were saying you you, you became the singer we became a singer and we kind of the sort of three girls who are sort of backing singers and then um, Jeremy playing bass and Rob Bliss, who um, does all the uh, character design for uh, uh, ha- um, Harry Potter and all those sort of things. He d- he was playing guitar and Neil on drums. Uh, and then we and then Jeremy decided he couldn't play some really easy like Taxi Driver cover of the. Do you remember? Um, I'll be your taxi driver for your honey, take me anywhere you want to. So that's just the simplest song you could ever, and he said, no, I can't play it, I'm going to have to leave. (laughs) Obviously, years later, we realised that's because we were completely shit, and we wanted to be in a proper band. So then we had another... It does sound like a proper band, maybe not from a musical aspect, but it sounds, in terms of the dynamics, that sounds as proper as it's going to get. So yeah, then we did, um, we played a lot locally, and... Then we got a sort of big management sort of coming in and trying to sort of get us together and form this big deal. We were rehearsing in Hammersmith Studios. and We're, we're the only band that actually rehearsed louder than Motorhead because we're Motorhead were rehearsing in the same studios and we were louder than they were. So, uh, and then we not, did... Tours. Not at the same time. You didn't have, uh, let me, oh, did you mind just turning it down a little bit? <laughs> yeah, these guys, it's getting a little bit... Oh, I, can't, I can't hear myself drink out here. <laughs> Anyway, so we did lots of gigs and and um, got drunk in limos and and smashed stuff up and we support the damned on a few tours and did that sort of stuff and the next well and that was yeah and then this early nineties kind of this this was eighties mid eighties mid eighties what I, so, I must uh, ask you about your your moisturising routine because you look a lot younger <laughs> than uh, well it, maybe, yeah, maybe no. it's just the the pixelation on Zoom but uh, you look a lot younger than I know actually did I haven't I haven't turned it on but I noticed there's a thing that makes you look lovely there's a is there a thing that makes you look lovely I think it's I a light switch you normally switch it off that's what I normally yeah. do <laughs> so yeah so that took us up to the nineties and then we formed another I was doing another band with with Rob no Steve Bliss which was Rob Bliss's brother. And Steve Bliss does all the artwork for Grand Theft Auto. He's like the biggest, you know, he's one of the biggest illustrators in the world, you know, the most famous illustrators. And he, his girlfriend and uh, our mate SG formed this band called Death by Cleavage, which was a, it was, it was called, what do we call it? Acid Thrash, it was called. We described it as Acid Thrash. And it was a, basically a keyboard that none of us could operate properly. And uh, two guitarists, no bass player, and two vocalists, and we did we did a series of inexplicably successful gigs. Um, well, they weren't ex- well. Basically, we supported the Pretenders, and the right. only reason we, the only reason we got the gig was because um, Chrissy Hyde wanted our to shag our mate Steve who's playing guitar, and he's actually in the Pretenders videos. Um, there's a video of them, a guy in a bath, and Chrissy Hines sort of giving him a bit of a clean. That was that was the guitarist Steve out of our band, and she said, "Oh, do you want to support us on tour?" And he went, "Yeah, do you want to hear a demo?" And she said, "Nah, it'd be fine." And of course, it was just so we got this. We we're playing um, Highbury, the garage in Islington, and Astoria, and the Astoria with them, and we did this. This the first one was the. I can't which one was first. But we took our own sound engineers and we could be louder than the pretenders. That was our own sort of what we'd do to be better than them, just make it louder. So That was your USB. That there is a recurring theme throughout this. Well, I only was ever in bands to inflict pain on people and make them miserable. So that was that was my only reason for making music was to sort of, you know, cause trouble, really. 
So we had this engineer and it was so loud. And the good thing about the pretenders was that they had an audience that wouldn't leave. You know, they, they, they were holding that position at the front of the stage, no matter what happened to them. And it was just, and apparently the review, the finest review we ever had was, it was like having a dentist drill in the ear was apparently what it was like. So there you go. And um, yeah, so we... Mission accomplished. Yeah, done. That was that was our music career over with, you know. Once you'd, you'd, you'd hit the peak fairly early and thought... Dentist drill in the ear, there's nowhere you can go from that really, is No, we there? can't well, better this. Nah, time, time for a change. Know retire and so from the music obviously you'll we'll talk about music a little bit more later because i know it's still a very much an important part of your life uh, but how did you then get into illustration and then photography well um obviously i was doing a degree course in illustration so that was um i started out painting so i painted for like 10 years or so um doing caricatures you know stuff radio times guardian uh, observer every you know loads of ad campaigns that kind of stuff so it was quite a splashy kind of loose sort of you know someone used to say, said to me um i was on some group thing or they were interviewing me about it I said uh, i said i have to wear i have to basically paint in just my pants with a frisbee because so much paint gets and he said i can't imagine you know getting paint on myself oh i don't wouldn't miss the canvas i mean how do you how do you actually get paint on yourself if you're and i sent him one of my pictures for him but oh my god that's amazing uh, uh, uh. and it was like yeah i'm drunk and i'm naked and i've got a frisbee and that's how i work so yet still and then, quite big commercial projects by the sound yeah, of yeah 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 they su- the, the Radio Times actually commissioned me to work drunk. They sent me around a box of wine and said, all right, can you do one of these? And I said, yeah, but I've got to be pissed. And they said, all right, I'll send you some wine around. So they biked around some wine for me to do a painting of Björk for the Radio Times. So that was good. Commissioned to work drunk for the Radio Times. I also caused an international incident between Turkey and Britain. I do a caricature of their prime minister, which they actually officially complained about. Um, and many other... Like you know, upset lots of people. Work for Punch, okay, that kind of shit. Yeah, but a real mix of things. If you're saying that you were well from one side, splashing things around quite loosely, and then doing caricatures and illustrations for um, well, they were still newspapers. Yeah, that was the splashing around. That was the stuff that I was, I was getting covered thing. in paint for. Yeah, but they were huge. They were like A one. I used to, they used to send a bike for my pictures. This is back before the internet. And they had to scan this, a drum scan, an A1 picture. It was then printed that big in the Radio Times. They're absolutely yeah. huge. It's just, it's just like mental. So, so gone from, what, a, a metre a meter by a metre to a couple of inches. Yeah. Did you ever push the limits to see how big you could make the canvases, knowing that they'd be a, a couple of inches square? Um, just, not really. Just to be a pain I, in did, the <laughs> I didn't actually consider that. I mean, I think I did that anyway by accident. So it was, there was no, it was just, I don't think anyone ever complained that they were huge. They just sent bigger and bigger bikes. So it was kind of like, you know, a, a sort of Pantechnican trailer sort of turns up. Tour bus, you know, Metallica's tour bus turns up to carry all my pictures to the, that didn't happen. Um, and then I was doing the painting for um, a record cover, which is actually how I met my wife, weirdly enough, uh, who's a singer. Um, and it was, I was working for EMI and halfway through doing this cover for this band Goldbug, they said, oh, can you do it? Like, can you do computer animate? Can you do computer illustration? I went, yeah, of course I can. And um, I said, well, can you do like a cover and then design it on three formats? I said, no problem. Didn't even have a computer. So I kind of like, at, at the time I was, I was living, I was I living with, yeah. Say yes I'm, first and then I work out the implications. Yeah, just afterwards. lie. Just lie, so you can do it. Then I, I actually was living with uh, Vic Reeves at the time and sort of best mates with Jonathan Ross. And Jonathan Ross and Vic Reeves clubbed together to buy me a computer and a camera which they and a scanner, which they gave to me. And then I spent three months in, in, the, in the house in the country with Vic Reeves learning to um, computer illustrate, which I kind of did and designed it on three formats and then took... I remember taking the artwork to EMI, but it was on 20 floppy disks that were all linked together. So you had to put, you had to back it up twice. So I had 40 floppy disks with the artwork and the design on it, which you took and plugged into a floppy drive, and it assembled the, the single piece of artwork out of 20 floppy disks. 
they're going to be like... people listening to this or watching this and not have a clue what you're talking about. Floppy no. disk. And, yeah, uh, no. It's like, that was before... I know. I know some people they'll see the the save icon on something and think oh why is that weird little little icon yeah. on the screen what does that mean that is an original floppy disk or presumably they were the the ones before then which were even floppier and could have no no it was the proper it was the little black square plastic things that had a, it with a they were cut to, off. yeah sidequest drives after that which were a bit bigger they had five megabytes for a sidequest drive which was like the size of a a small book you know basically that you used to plug into like a cartridge system. It was just fucking crazy. Which, could, just like, which these days could hold half a photo you've taken on your yeah. smartphone. I'm oh, not even that. It would a whole Sidequest drive would hold a quarter of one of my shots. You know, less than a quarter. Which mm. is just yeah, it's less than a phone picture. One phone picture. So yeah, yeah so I I basically did that, and then I was in digital illustration, which I did for another ten years, um, doing stuff for Lloyd's Bank every. You know, advertising agency in the world you've already expressed your disinterest in anything sociable mm. did you what was your sort of contact with these people like were they, would they just phone you up and say we need this doing can you do it or would you have to go yeah. into board meetings no, and... no never went to board meetings I mean, that was the funny thing that i was doing so i was doing the lloyd's bank um you know the little train that say yeah yeah little, um so I did all the original sort of character design for that and, and, and ad development with the animator who's, he came up with basically the project, but his project, much like Game of Thrones, was taking far too long to do. So they had to get some more in to write, finish up the first series so they could actually release something. And that was me. So I was doing all the kind of extrapolated from his roughs what the actual style would look like. And then I was doing those for Lloyd's Bank. But it's adding in a bit more what? fighting and boobs and stuff, and it's ready to yeah, go. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah, hell. Illustration then led into photography because when I met you six or seven years ago, I think it was, uh, you I saw you as the the wacky photographer in a gym taking pictures of rippling muscles, uh, which at one point I did fit into. I think I wouldn't be much of a muse these days. How did you go from illustration into photography? Well. The, the sort of style of digital illustration I was doing was basically taking photographs, originally with a proper camera and film, and then scanning them and then cutting them up and joining them back together again to create something. So that first record cover that I did was it was a, a woman's face created out of Barbie doll faces. So what I did is photograph loads of Barbie dolls and join them back together again. And really what it looked like was a dead pig's head with flies on it. But... No, by that point, there'd been too much time spent on it and they couldn't get out of it, so it was released. And then I gradually, with the photography, I was going, you know, this is in the early days of digital cameras, so this was like, you know, I had a camera that cost a grand that took a picture that was smaller again than a phone picture and more crap. And then that took me to the Lloyds, through the Lloyds thing, which is all, again, it was photographs of rust, of textures, which I'd then combined with, you know, shapes that I'd drawn in Photoshop to create these illustrations. And then after the Lloyds thing, I basically went mad and just lost it, my shit. I was working like, uh, I worked solid with three months without a break, like seven days a week, 12 hours, 14 hours a day. And after that, I just couldn't, I couldn't do, I couldn't do illustrate. They'd ring me up, my agent would ring me up and go, we've got a cover to do for so-and-so. They've got 300 quid. I'd go, oh, fuck it. I can't be bothered. You know, I can't, I can't take it seriously. So I did, what I did was work with Bill Bailey. If you've completely fallen apart through stress and work, the perfect person to go and work for is Bill Bailey, who is just so completely chilled out. It's almost hard to get anything done. So he'll kind of like, you'll be working on an idea around at his house and he'll suddenly get a parrot out and, and, and you know, oh, look at this, I've got this parrot that does this and that. Look, do you think if we bang this radiator with these sticks, we can actually get a little tune out of that thing? They go, yeah, Bill, let's, let's get back and, you know, get back, focus, website. Oh yeah, website, website. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, so we did the many and then his wife would cook us a nice curry and then we'd have to like just chat and then he'd just get completely stoned and then you'd get nothing else out of him. So then we so we developed the eventually did this website, which was great fun, fully kind of animated before you know anyone cared about how big websites were and how long it took to download them. And then I worked on the Tinsel Worm tour um, uh, design for the books and a few bits and pieces on that. And that was just and then it was like I was at the point where I just couldn't face doing commercial illustration. It was just it was too stressful. And I was at the gym and I'd been 
working, you know, taking the camera for fun to gyms yeah. for quite a while, decided I wanted to do an exhibition. So the concept of the exhibition was I was going to photograph, because my wife works a lot in the gay community uh, with a lot of drag queens and that kind of thing. I thought what would be fucking brilliant would be to have an exhibition that was half drag queens and half bodybuilders around the sort of concept that they changed themselves and, uh, you know, just transform themselves. And you'd have one bodybuilder, one drag queen, and then the private view would be just like chaos. I mean, you can imagine drag queens and bodybuilders in the same room. You know, all the, yeah. all the, the, the stuff that would go on there, you know, just the fights, the, the, the trysts, that would uh, you know occur yeah, they're not those... natural communities actually there is some overlap obviously but there's not they're not necessarily not the natural communities to. that would interlink yeah no so that was and i was just doing shots i was basically taking pictures at the gym for my own amusement and then people started going oh can you do you know a couple for me you know and that's sort of that's how that developed really i literally for some reason ended up photographing men in their pants with no plan no there's no plan ever to do this it's incredible so, what you fall into when you're not expecting yeah. it. So that yeah. was, yeah, so that, that was, I did basically 10 years, more or less, photography I've been doing. So, you know, and then that's developed into doing, you know, I did ads for British Gas, um, you know, some commercial stuff. A lot of babies, but just why would you ask me to photograph your baby? But there you go. You know, someone obviously thought my photograph of a naked man, I'll do my baby. It's, yeah, the, same clothing. It's the same wardrobe. It is the it's same wardrobe. Slightly different physique. They look like a giant toddler with a nappy on. It's taking the, the before and after photos to an extreme, isn't it? Yes, this is my yeah. my, <laughs> my my four week old baby. And yeah. uh, we're going to do a uh, twenty five year transformation program, and we'll get you back in to get the results. Yeah, and here he is now. Oh. What would you be doing at the moment if? Well, before the lockdown, January, which feels like a million years ago, what would you be? What would you have been doing in January? What was your day to day? I mean, January is obviously for anything in fitness, especially photography, is a dead zone. You know, everyone's got fat over Christmas. No one's sort of trained. So what I'm doing is booking, like the whole summer shoots. So you you know you take a deposit. People you know doing part payments. You know that kind of stuff. And then, um, obviously, as soon as the gym shut. That was, I and mean, I was working the day before the gym shut. So, you know, that was in there doing that week was quite busy. Uh, do a lot of transformation stuff, um, do a lot of things with people where, you know, they've kind of lost, you know, 40 pounds or something and, and you know, turned into a Greek god. And then, you know, or um, so I was working with a lot of people like Chris Spearman, I was doing a lot of stuff with, still am. And then it just started, I mean, literally overnight, it was gone, you know. Um, and, Obviously, because of the you know the way that my work had gone, I'd, I'd spent all that time sort of building up my illustration and then just dropped it. Yeah. So I didn't even have a portfolio really at all. My agent was still a friend, you know, and I just rang him and said, "Look, I've got to do something." I said, "I've got no photography work, you know. I need a portfolio. I need something. What shall I do?" He goes, "Well, you know, try this." So I, you know, and that's how I sort of that's what I've been doing for the last two months basically. So you've made the most of the enforced time away from photography to actually be useful and and put something into place um for for future work well yeah i mean the i mean the amount of time i mean to do what i did over the last two months would have taken six months or more to actually achieve that without lockdown you know so you know when do you get the opportunity to work for like nine hours a day on something that isn't paying the rent you know, it never happens, you know, and and it's such a rare occurrence. I mean, it is a remarkable time to, you know, it's a gift, you know, really is yeah. to, to, to do things, to actually have the time to develop things that you just don't have the time to do. You know, I don't have enough hours in the day. That's my problem is that I don't physically have enough time to do everything I need to do. But that's... None of it pays anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Completely broke, obviously. Oh, yeah, but money's a thing of the past. That's Money is so 2019. It's Star Trek. It's Star Trek. Currency is not a thing. We don't work for acquisition of wealth. That's not. We're in the we're in the future. It's it's great that you've been able to use the time to do that. But I, one of the issues I've been having is I've had the time, but not the right mentality, not the right headspace to be creative. You know, it would mm. be an ideal opportunity to write new jokes and i need new jokes my old ones are terrible uh, or write some songs or redesign my website i've been telling myself for the last four years oh i 
I must redo my photography website. I don't have time to do it. And now I do have time. I've tried mm. just staring at the screen and just don't have the uh, have the inspiration. Oh, hang on. We've just had the delivery of... Uh, Blinis with caviar. We're, oh. we're, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Yeah. I've got <laughs> caviar with the blinis. It was <laughs> nine, 90 seconds ago you were saying how broke you are. And mm. uh, now, oh God, we, we're having to cut down on our caviar. <laughs> We're only having caviar three times a week now. <laughs> and we've had to lay off uh, four of our staff. Yeah, it's dreadful. Uh, three cars have gone. My aeroplane's been grounded. Um, <laughs> so, okay. my the, the, What you're saying to me is that you're struggling to find inspiration to do the thing that you were doing already yes. for no money, essentially. Um, I suppose if you, to break it down like that, yeah, but even things like even playing the guitar before mm. turning that into a profession, I've, I've been playing the guitar since I was eight or nine years old and I'd love to just pick it up and I'd mess around with things, play around with different riffs mm. or jam along to, to other songs and teach myself. But I've got eight, nine guitars sitting in front of me at the moment, hanging on the walls. And my inspiration to just pick it up and actually start playing has reduced to to sort of a fraction of what it was before when I was stupidly busy and I was going out working most days, going out gig, gigging at weekends. And I just don't have that inspiration. I'm just wondering how you find that headspace or whether you've never had that issue, whether you are just someone who goes, right, this is happening, this is flooding out, or do you need to get into the zone? No. I just need to, I need to be left alone long enough to actually do what I want to do. That's I mean most of my problem is like you know I'm surrounded by family people and children and wives bringing in continue. snacks. What bastards! Yeah, they? bringing me caviar. Oh, but I just um, I don't know. I mean I, I don't think I don't think I'm normal in the in that respect. Like I've always got I mean I've got a book I'm trying to write at the same time. So I'm really and I'm thinking I've got to do this. To my agent saying we need more illustrations for this thing. You know, obviously, it'd be nice to earn some money. That's the that's the real downside. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know why. I can't really imagine. Perhaps you should buy yourself a new guitar. Yes, I've got to try and convince certain other. Gulliver's got a band. Catherine bought Gulliver a banjo when the when the lockdown thing started. So he's got a banjo. So that's it's got cool to have a new thing. Yeah, I think you need something new. I think that's the, the your problem is that you're doing old things. What you need to do is take the opportunity to do something completely new. You you say that. Five weeks ago, I bought myself a oh. keyboard, as in a piano keyboard, and I signed up for online lessons. And I think I've had it on three times. Mm. Uh, I think, right, I'm going to do this. It's going to be really useful. You're just shit. That is me. The problem's me. It's nothing. It's not my environment. It's just purely me. Right. It's taken. Yeah, this fucked. is yeah, this it. is this is episode five, and it's taken. <laughs> Talking you're to doing five this. people to realise it. This is, yeah, this is what you're doing. <laughs> this is just your way of getting therapy and advice for free, isn't it? Yeah, what one free sample have therapy a, session? Have a shave, have a wash, you know. A what? Drink more. <laughs> <laughs> have some caviar. These are the life lessons that we're taking out of it. Mm. And so. You're making me <laughs> hungry as well. Again, if you're listening to the podcast version of this and not watching the webcast, it may sound quite confusing there are lots of slurping noises coming from mm. the other end of this conversation and uh, <sighs> random giggles yeah. any caviar producers would like to sponsor this podcast and you know, i've got to reach for about 12 people at the moment it's the source you know, you know man. where to find me caviar's the source <laughs> and also what you should try doing is alternate your drinking habits like i mean i never drink before six o'clock this is my advice to you young people am or pm don't drink before six PM, obviously. Yeah, because I know you're an early riser, call, that's all. Yeah, I know. We call it Rioca Clock around here. <laughs> so, yeah, alternate between red and white wine. Don't drink anything else. So, you know, make sure you organise your meals around your wine colours. And, you know, you'll live a long, happy life. We've established... I know that you're a prolific creator anyway, because I've seen, even when you're not necessarily working... I've seen what you're producing on Instagram. I've seen all the Squirrelissimo, which a lot of people oh, yeah. know. Is, is Squirrelissimo still going? He is. That's the book I'm writing. So that's, I've, you know, been trying to finish that for years. And I've got a lot of backing, a lot of interest in it. Because obviously those images have got like millions and millions yeah. of views and, and, and shares. And I just had to write a book basically to go around 
you know, fit with that work. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Squirrelissimo's, Max, over the last, I don't know how many years, has set up various little scenes and attracted the local squirrels in with with nuts and uh, seeds and things and they reenact well the pumpkin ones are are fairly famous so a squirrel with a pumpkin over its head making it look like it's wearing a pumpkin mask you've got stunt men i believe you've got squirrel bands you've got squirrel diy all sorts of stuff like that haven't you um, little umbrella umbrellas yeah mm. so that's that's what the book is is it um, essentially, I mean, what, what I'm trying to do is, is basically how he's coming to being is that he's a magic trick gone wrong. So, so there's a magician with a magic hat who's trying to get a rabbit, gets a squirrel who escapes. And that squirrel comes from the squirrel dimension. So his journey is to try and get back to his own world while communicating, you know, with the outside world. So I've got the, I'm basically, I'm just going to, I've got to just the usual the, stuff then. Straightforward just a stand, stuff. A standard plot. Yeah, for the three to four year olds. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's that, and then the stags are still going, and I'm still sort of trying to get out there. But it's, it's a, I mean, the only really good thing he said, really nastily and selfishly, is it's a terrible time of year to photograph stags because they've just got lost their antlers. They look like sort of shit cows with like not even proper antlers. So all those wannabe photographers are out there. I've got literally nothing to photograph. There's like, you know, a few miserable stags wandering around. But that's, it's sort of nice. That's the one of the things I do just for the pleasure of photography, really. Just, you know, love being out there at dawn, away from people, um, not socialising, except and with stags. Yeah, so it, it feels like you, you never have an issue getting into that creative zone. But when when you are working... Do you do you shut yourself away, or do you sit out on the terrace uh, when you're um, doing your illustrations, or how how do you create that environment? I just to, listen to, to music. Okay. So I just play music. So I mean, I'm you know, I've I've kind of I used to be in the front room where the gym is, so I've had to move upstairs uh, into another little room. Um, so I don't have my vinyl, which is quite sad because I love. I, mean, I buy all music on vinyl. I don't buy anything not on vinyl, but. You know, obviously you get your MP3, hopefully with the vinyl, unless they're tight and don't include it, which I just annoys me so much. You get a record, there's no download with it. And I know we've chatted Terrible. a little bit about your musical influences and they go range from everything from Monster Magnet and Metallica through to Steve Earle on the more country end. And do you, <laughs> this is a question I was, I was actually chatting to my dad about this, about how people use music to either reflect their mood or influence their mood. So when you're listening to music, do you put on music that reflects how you feel at the, the time or do you put on music to try and change I think, that sort of emotion? Uh, I think it's more of a, a choosing something to fit your current mood for me. I, I do use music to alter it, but more I use it to um, support it. So if I'm in a, a sort of focus... I mean, to be honest, when the lockdown first happened, I could only listen to one record. I listened to it endlessly, it on repeat, for like days and days and days. And that was, uh, do you know the artist Merka? Have you heard of Merka? She's um, uh, no. Danish um, and she's, uh, um, she's does a lot of black metal. Her, she's uh, based in black metal, but okay. she does traditional folk music as well. She's just released an album of traditional folk music. And it is so like literally just something that was made a thousand years ago. It's all Viking instruments and that kind of thing. So she uses those weird strung things with like uh, keys on, but she's got an amazing voice and does all that cow calling, you know, the uh, sort of Swedish cow calling that really high pitched, strange yeah. otherworldly voice. And um, so she just really, and it's like literally like steel eye span, you know, kind of plinky plonky <laughs> kind of, uh, like folk music and it's just it was perfect because it was just totally calming and totally it enabled you to just zone out most of it's in um, in, in danish so that right. you don't understand anything she's saying but it's just the sound of her voice and the general feel of it was just completely relaxing just totally enabling you to focus like totally on what you were doing and that's what I, when i was doing the illustration work i'd just have that on on repeat so it was just play end after end after end and it would just um you know I mean, now i've oh. moved back into sort of heavier shit but 
Do you know? I'll have a listen to her. That she sounds like well, be interesting. She's amazing. To her anyway, she's one of my. I mean, literally, she's the, the album before this was is it, it fused the, the folk and the black metal, um, but there's a lot heavier stuff like blast beats in it and stuff. Whereas this, the latest album, folk sound, is um, just folk music. She's got death yeah. threats. So this is a <laughs> this is like a pregnant. She's pregnant at the time, um, and receiving death threats for making folk music from black metal fans so you know that's that's the level of that's the kind of people we're <laughs> talking about here welcome is, to scandinavia you know, yeah yeah <laughs> you don't blame us blast beat talking fucking guy yeah <laughs> so yeah no and um but i i mean i listen to like you know music all day like literally and and the only i used to listen to um Six music, which I now despise intensely, and can't even. If I hear it, it just annoys me immediately. And then I moved on to listening to uh, Team Rock, so it was like a um, okay. based yep. radio station, which entertained me for a while. Now I just listen to two podcasts every week, and they give me enough music to listen end to end. You know, they're just amazing. I mean, an amazing resource. Uh, that's you, not you... metal. Okay. And uh, Riot Act podcast. And between the two of them, that cover they cover pretty much um, it's the heavier end of music. Right Act is a bit more indie and covers like a lot of female vocalists who are you know this new folk stuff and uh, like quirky sort of um, you know really oddball stuff. I mean you know the oddest stuff. I mean I just um, there's an artist called Lingu Ignota who's uh, an American um, artist who wrote who's a classically trained opera singer who's um, created an album about she was abused and raped over systematically by a boyfriend over years and written an album about it and it's just the heaviest and it's just operatic basically screaming and operatic and and darkness and it's got tracks like you know if the poison doesn't kill you my dogs will and and things like that and you know die fucking scum and that but done in the most you know amazing way it's just like you know just just shockingly honest and and just mood altering you know you listen to that you'll come out the other end feeling quite traumatized which i do like you're definitely adding artists to my listening list i don't know uh <laughs> oh, are mate, you gonna be some of the last people ever listening to just yeah just go all day yeah, yeah. Oh, i love it i mean every, every week uh you know there's a great album by elephant tree british band like stoner met stoner band that are just brilliant and absolutely it's a little song about a sparrow in it which we love me and simply like similar sort of stuff uh greek death they're uh, from michigan who've uh, just fused two guys with like the most almost sound like buddy holly but with kind of a like uh almost grungy kind of slow sorrowful music you know just but just powerful you know, Pegasus. Well, it's, check it out. You, we love it. Some... Nobody else likes it. <laughs> Nobody else. But that that was that was a fair. That just exactly nailed it. But like, uh, I just you know, just we love this shit. We mean, we, we listen to sort of similar sort of horrible it, but, stuff as well. Buddy, buddy, melancholy. Nice, I like it. it. It's a better yeah. name than Greek death. <laughs> That just sounds like a terrible experience in a taverna on holiday, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> which is maybe where they got the inspiration. Uh, I'd like to move on because we are we are flying through this podcast. It's a testament to uh, how much... Yeah, I was I'm, moaning I'm, about it being longer than five minutes. <laughs> yeah, but then you got food and it's sorted itself Aww. out. I think I already know the answer partly to this question, but how do you think this whole lockdown quarantine period will affect how you work in future? I don't know. It's a very tricky... I mean, obviously, with the work that I'm doing, the photography stuff, I will continue to uh, work with the people that I've, I've booked with. So I've got, I've got a fair amount of bookings that um, are going to go ahead. And people will still ask me to do stuff. But I've really missed the kind of having uh, illustration to do alongside it because it's. I love the contrast. I love not knowing what I'm going to be doing when I get up in the morning. You know, one day if I'm doing an illustration, next day a photo shoot. That's for me is you know, then yeah. talk to a squirrel. You know, that's that's you know, that for me is a makes variety. me happy. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to. I essentially don't want to leave the house. I want to go to one gym and my house, and apart from that, I don't want to. And the park, uh, I don't want to go anywhere else apart from on holiday. 
So it's um, you know that's that's my would be ideal for me. So I'm going to nail that. That's my uh, hope. And do you think the the balance? Well, I think the balance for everybody in the creative industry and probably in in most industries will have to change because people have discovered new ways or been forced to discover new ways to work. Mm. Do you think with this new portfolio that you've set up, do you think you'll be embracing the way that that balance has changed? Well, hopefully. I mean, that's really is fingers crossed because I think that's that's you know obviously being creative you're an endangered species you know that's that's the bottom line and you've got to evolve to actually uh, get out of that and i mean you know it, it's it's such a hard time for creatives do you, do you have any words of wisdom that you may like to impart with our well, listeners I think, I think i'd probably like to reinforce what i said to you earlier about trying something new i mean i think it's i think it's it may not be uh, an obvious route but say you know instead of trying to play the guitar, you did a painting or did some drawing or all that kind of thing. It, it, it's almost like you've got to find a way of using your time positively without becoming bored with what you do. I think that the, the issue with um, having, um, is continuing to do the same thing as you were doing before, is that it's easy to get bored and disinterested because you're not really exploring a new avenue. Okay. Yeah. So keep keeping things fresh. Yeah, totally. I think you've got to, you know, you've got to feel inspired and it's hard to be inspired if you're doing exactly what you did before lockdown, even if it's, you know, like get a new instrument. You've got your keyboard, you know, form a band. We'll do a band. Uh, all I need to do is uh, find a sexy guitarist to get in a bathtub with Chrissy Hine and then... Uh then I'm sorted. That's my career done. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> She's probably, you know, up for that, I'd imagine, Chrissy. Send her a picture. I will do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a lot of fun chatting to you, Max. I've found it quite insightful and uh, had a good giggle along the way. I think I've taken some really nice things out of it. Uh, obviously, the sexy guitarist in the band, that's, mm-hmm. the, uh, that's a little tip for musicians. If you want to get ahead in the more sort of corporate creative industries lie through your teeth if you can't do something say you can and then Don't learn how boys. to do it and i think the the biggest message is to alternate between red and white wine and you'll live a long and happy and interesting life so yeah here i am here you are the, the living the living proof of an interesting yeah. life right Ooh. there max Thank you so much for agreeing yeah, to be on you. Lockdown Booty Calls. I've enjoyed this a lot and take care. Enjoy the rest of you your too. Lockdown you too, Robin. Look after yourself. This is a Lockdown Booty Calls.